be here. Thanks so much for having me. Um, one of the most um, compelling scenes in Geek Girl Rising actually takes place in Chattanooga. Um, and I had the chance to spend time with the women who founded the Jump Fund. And so that's why it's really apropos that we're doing this panel today because what's happening in Chattanooga, I think, really typifies what's happening in other uh, parts of the country outside of Silicon Valley uh, where tech ecosystems are starting to bubble up and our panelists today are really active in those efforts and we're going to talk about that. So starting off, we have Lori Feinsilver. She's the head of community affairs and corporate responsibility and executive communications for UBS Americas. Uh, in the center, we have Leslie Miley. He's a Silicon Valley native who worked in engineering leadership roles at Twitter, Google, and Apple, and is the director of engineering at Slack. And he's currently working with Venture for America, which we're going to hear more about in a moment. And finally, we have Nick Smoot, who founded and sold three tech companies. He's the founder of the Innovation Collective and Mountain Man Ventures, and he's based in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. So guys, all three of you are leaders in the movement to accelerate startup activity in new parts of the country and to tap diverse talents in those locales. But you all come from very different backgrounds. So just to jump off, let's set the stage with kind of a quick overview of your journeys. How did you get into this? Um, how did your formative experiences lead you, lead, lead, lead you here? So let's start off with, with Lori. I mean, UBS, you wouldn't necessarily think of a global investment bank being involved in early stage female-led ventures, yet that's, that's what one of your initiatives. Yeah, so we, um, you know, it's, it's really twofold. I run all of our uh, community efforts, our charitable giving in the Americas, and we have a really strong focus on entrepreneurship and particularly inclusive entrepreneurship. And it's really twofold. Um, first and foremost, the barriers to entry for entrepreneurship, particularly amongst women, are, are really stark. And so giving opportunity to you know, more than half the population is critical uh, from a number of standpoints. But in, importantly, um, when we look at the economic benefits, when we look at the social benefits, and you look at the innovation that we're missing with this talent not participating, uh, it's tremendous. And so uh, socially, we're, we're really focused on that. And as a business, um, when you look at wealth creation, entrepreneurship is absolutely a pathway to helping people fulfill their lives and, and the dreams and, and what they want to have. And I think when we look at that and and the amount of challenges that, that still exist in, in enabling that for people across the country, um, that's huge. And so that's kind of how we approach it and think about it. I want to get back to, I want to let everybody else kind of give their backgrounds, but definitely want to talk about Project Entrepreneur yeah. and also how that program, um, you know, the impact that you've seen in the couple years that it's been around. Um, so let's go to Leslie now. Um, so. You gained a national profile um, for publicly calling out the diversity problem in tech when you stepped down from your role as engineering uh, manager at Twitter in 2015. Um, and you went on to become the director of engineering at Slack. And now you're running an initiative that connects communities far removed from the valley, like Detroit and Baltimore, to tech executives who will help guide these cities in their attempts to create new startup hubs. Why did you take on this role, and how did your experiences um, as an engineer in the Valley, and I know you grew, you grew up in the Valley too, how did that lead you to this point? I, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, I, so having been raised in Silicon Valley, one of the things that, that really surprised me is that I didn't grow up in tech, I grew up around tech. My father actually worked at General Motors on an assembly line in Silicon Valley for 26 years. And when manufacturing collapsed in the 80s and 90s, he lost his job. And he lost his job and effectively has never worked again. And he, when he lost his job, he's younger than I am today. He was younger than I am today. So that's, that was, was really formative to my experience. And as I started to go through you know, my life in tech and realizing that it was uplifting so many people, it was generating so much wealth, and people of color and women were actually just being left behind. And one of the reasons that I was able to take advantage of it is because I, was, I had home field advantage. I was there. It was around me all the time. So when, you know, I, I, I used the, the, the term when I came out black on Twitter and found that I had an opportunity to, uh, <clears throat> when I had an opportunity to um, actually start having the conversation of, 
of what happens in places like Detroit and Baltimore and Providence and how we can take what we have learned in Silicon Valley and work with other communities. You know, you just kind of jump at that chance. Uh, what go is going on in this country is, is, you know, whether you agree with it or not, it, a lot of it is based in economic uncertainty, is economic anxiety, and it's because many of us have forgotten where we've come from. And, and even though, you know, I grew up in Silicon Valley, you know, my childhood, my upbringing was funded by Detroit, was funded by manufacturing. So I really have a, a it resonates with me when I go to cities and see what they're trying to do. And I just really want to accelerate that as much as I can. I love, I love, that. I didn't know that story, and that's a really interesting anecdote. I love asking people about where they came from and why, so I, thank you for sharing that. Um, and I want to come back to Venture for America and specifically what, you know, what you're doing um, with that. So, but Nick, you started out as an entrepreneur, and then you took yes. your experiences into investing with Mountain Man Ventures, and ultimately you built the Innovation Collective, which helps cities participate in the innovation economy. Um, why did you do it? And uh, and then you know, why don't you talk to us a little bit about how the collective does this? Like, what yeah. what do you actually do when you go into these communities, like where you live in Coeur d'Alene, yeah. Idaho? Yeah, for me, I'm I am the outsider. Uh, so I grew up in a home where my mother was a pharmacist technician, my dad was a mechanic, and I lived in Idaho. Um, and so then I had this crazy idea I wanted to get into mobile technology uh, and get out of Idaho. So I left primarily to do that. And so built my companies, one uh, out of Seattle, um, one out of Oahu, uh, one out of Los Angeles, lives all over the United States. And I realized the whole time I was the one trying to break into Sand Hill Road, and I was the one trying to get the attention of all the big tech companies. And I actually got good at it. And, uh, and then realized one time when I went home on, uh, on a vacation to see my family, my parents who moved back to Coeur d'Alene, uh, I was looking around, it was a New Year's Eve party, and I'm in a bow tie, and my wife's in a little cocktail dress, and we went out to like five different restaurants and bars looking for a place where we felt kind of at home. And there were no t late 20, early 30 you know, young professionals out. Mm. And it was shocking to me that uh, the only place we felt comfortable, we went to this one place where people were um, kind of, it seemed like professional, and everyone was 70 plus, it felt like, and it was shocking to me. And uh, I realized how unfair it is that uh, friends of mine who I played AAU basketball with were in LA running hedge funds or Santa Barbara in politics. And each one of them, when I asked them, I said, would you go home if there was a job there that you felt was respect respectful of your skills? And all of them said yes. So it hit me um, that I had to do something about it. And so I took a very non-traditional approach to venture capital which is Innovation Collective is the platform, and then we have our fund, Mountain Man, on the side. Um, so to, to, is it okay if I jump into Innovation Please, Collective? Please, yeah, yeah, and then I'll come back the other way, and you guys Perfect. can just talk about your initiatives. Perfect, I just feel like I was going longer. So <laughs> um, Innovation Collective, what we're doing is we go into a city and focus heavily on human flourishing. And our thought is that most of these people are disenfranchised. They feel left behind. And um, in that, they're broken, right? We're all broken uh, as people. And so we need to address those issues first and understand how can we uh, rise up, kind of bond together. And we challenge them to be more, period. That's step one, and uh, a lot of that is the entrepreneurial spirit. And then once that starts to develop in the, a culture in the community, uh, almost as a brand of this rally cry, we then start focusing on what is the exponential technology that the city could obsess over. Mm -hmm. And we dive into their historic economy, look at what's going on in the moment, and we work closely with Singularity University as well, a lot of the folks there. Mm -hmm. And we look into the future, kind of read the tea leaves, and say, what could they do that respects the past so there's mentorship still and the old wise sage who doesn't feel left behind? And surprisingly, each city has a story, right? That's mm -hmm. what they're built around. And it's not that far off. Software ate their industry and destroyed it. And so they can reclaim a piece of it somewhere. And once we lock in that X, uh, we then start flying in experts like crazy. And so can you just list a couple of the cities that you're, that you're in right now? Yeah, Coeur d'Alene was the, the test bed. Now Butte, Montana, uh, Sandpoint, Idaho, Lodi, Italy, Lethbridge, Canada are the five. And we've got about another 34 lined up uh, that are reaching out on the inbound because like we were talking about, there's cities everywhere that are desperate. And the crazy piece is uh, once we have it locked uh, as a, a, a brand and a vertical, we adjust the laws and try and turn the city into almost a lab, like our R&D lab where K through 12, 
um, the nonprofits, the colleges, the government, everybody's, the senior citizens are innovating and thinking around a vertical. And we then try and um, then bring in a large corporate player that uh, in essence owns the city. Uh, but really what we're doing is we're helping them uh, shift their bloated capital mm -hmm. to a market that they may receive benefit out of. And if they don't, then at least it's good for their shareholders and it looks nice and you get some nice photos. Fascinating. I want to get, later on, I want to talk about retraining and vocational schools and yeah. kind of how all that fits into all of this in terms of sourcing talent. But Leslie, can you explain to the um, audience about Venture for America and specifically what is it and, um, and what is your role? Uh, so Venture for America is a two-year fellowship for, um, for uh, people coming out of college, and it, it deploys really passionate, really smart uh, college graduates who would normally go into consulting or go to Silicon Valley or go to New York to work in finance to cities like Baltimore and Cleveland and Columbus and New Orleans and to work in the startup communities there. It's kind of like a teach for America or code for America for entrepreneurship. Uh, so it, the, the goal is to place you know, these really energetic, passionate uh, individuals into these communities so they learn, into these startup communities so they learn entrepreneurship and so they create their own companies. Uh, and we have an entire program around training them to put them in, in these companies. We give them support you know, through their fellowship uh, and then we have an accelerator uh, afterwards so that if they decide to start companies, we can actually help with that as well. Uh, one of the, the, how I came to know about mm -hmm. Venture for America was at their training camp last year. They brought me in to, to, to speak. And, and the mission just resonated with me. But what resonated with me about it is something that we do in Silicon Valley really well. We take a lot of these grads and we pair them with engineer, senior engineers or senior product people or senior biz, business people and we help them learn and we help them accelerate their growth and then they go on to do you know, other things and some start their own companies, some work their way up through companies. And, 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 I, and I, you know, in looking and talking to the fellows, I said, what happens if we take some of the experience we have in Silicon Valley and pair it with these communities? And pair it with these communities so that they can, and I'm using an engineering term, shard across uh, you know, three, five, seven different companies so that they can use their expertise to, to understand the problems that are being solved and help them avoid some of the pitfalls that we've all, and to a certain extent, have learned to, to avoid, like what technologies to use, how to optimize for growth, uh, you know, how to do hire faster, how to hire, and we're talking about diversity, how to hire diverse teams. Mm -hmm. uh, and so this is the program that I'm working on right now, which is taking people out of Silicon Valley for six months to a year and placing them in Baltimore, placing them in Detroit to work across a group of companies so that they can learn the problems they're solving, you know, can bring what we do in Silicon Valley, you know, on a, on a just a regular basis, you know, and also learn about that community so that when they go back to Silicon Valley and become investors and become CEOs, that they now have a network where they can look to invest, they can look to grow. Mm -hmm. Deal flow, right, that they might not have seen before. Um, Lori, let's talk about um, Project Entrepreneurs. Your focus with that is, is, is on women-led companies. Um, tell us about the genesis and what you've seen in terms of um, what's actually out there. There are a lot of female-founded companies. There are. Um, I will just say, so we actually have been a partner with Venture for America since its earliest days. It was actually before mm -hmm. Andrew even uh, had his first class. I met him, um, gosh, I guess five or six years ago, and what he was doing and the opportunity we saw to really um, bring entrepreneurship local was huge. And so I think we were actually the first uh, corporate foundation to give. Um, but so, and we actually still partner with them on Project Entrepreneur, which for any of the entrepreneurs in the rooms, uh, in particularly the women, uh, this is an initiative to help build and nurture the pipeline of female founders starting high growth companies. So you hear the stat that women are starting companies at a faster rate than ever before, which is true. But when we looked at the data, we saw that they are starting very small companies, meaning that the, I believe it's something like less than four, about 4% 4 of women-owned companies generate over 500,000 in revenue. So if you think about that, women are not participating in these kind of big, major, transformative organizations um, that really can scale and, and have kind of all the economic and, and social benefits that we talked about. So we started Project Entrepreneur. It's a partnership with Rent the Runway Foundation. Um, and it's really about giving women, all of the women founders, all of the tools, resources, and expertise they need to grow and scale. We do a lot of research and a lot of um, kind of due diligence on what the barriers are that exist uh, that are preventing women from actually getting to that next stage. And a lot of it is around 
access to networks. Um, it's around access to different types of training and education, uh, particularly those in cities where you don't have a lot of uh, programming and resources. And so it's a nationwide effort. It starts with some, we have free summits in different places across the country, and then we have a venture competition where we invite 200 of the top female founders from across the country to come in for a two-day intensive. We bring experts from, you know, Silicon Valley, from New York, um, on everything from, you know, build, you know, MVP to raising capital to, um, you know, hiring talent. And they literally go through two days of nonstop uh, breakouts, workshops, and then 12 of them pitch uh, for a spot in a five-week accelerator at Rent the Runway. And a big part of the accelerator is when Jen and Jenny, the founders of uh, Rent the Runway, were building their business, they felt like there were a lot of great entrepreneurial centers and sharing spaces for entrepreneurs that were going through the same thing. But what they felt like would have been really helpful was that if someone kind of took them under their wing and really gave them access to all the things that they didn't know, right? So rather than people going through the same thing, people who were one or two years out that could really share their uh, their resources, their intellect, and so they go into Rent the Runway, they have full access to, you know, marketing, legal, you know, their CTO, everything. Um, and it's, you know, it's been incredible. We had, you know, there's a myth out there, I think, that female founders don't exist. We have over, in the past two years since we've run this, we've had 1,200 uh, female founders apply for our programs, 50% diversity. Um, so not only are women out there in droves ready to start these and grow these companies, um, diverse talent is out there, and we had 70 cities represented. We had a very big population in the southeast. Um, I remember some businesses from Memphis and, and Chattanooga, which is great. So it's um, and it's working. So we've seen. So it's been two years now. We all of the winners of the different venture competition. Um, sessions have all received seed funding. Uh, they've gone on to some very prestigious accelerators. And we've actually created this community where all of the entrepreneurs can actually uh, connect with other alumni and other resources throughout the year. So they can keep keep the network yeah. going, keep yes. building the network. But you were saying, so they're from 70 cities. So they're going yes. back. They're not staying in, in New York. They're not necessarily based in Silicon Valley. So I'm going to throw it to the panel. Why build a company outside Silicon Valley? Um, and what are the advantages um, for a startup to launch in, say, a second or third tier city? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm in the complete, like, maybe fourth and fifth tier cities, if those even <laughs> exist, with most, most of our operations. Um, but, you know, I think the advantage truly is you have to be uh, more intentional about the capital you spend, uh, and they're better at it, and you avoid the wisdom of the day. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, New York, San Francisco, London, LA, uh, you kind of get caught in this talk and thought. And most of these cities, people think an accelerator is something that is in your car, right? And, and have no idea what a convertible note is. And so when you give them a, a vertical and a problem and a challenge, you introduce them to a potential platform or technology, what they come up with is mind bending because they're so far removed uh, mm. from the, the bro culture or whatever else goes on. Anything else want to add? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I like what you're saying. It's, it's like the number of different JavaScript frameworks that come up to just be an engineer out of Silicon Valley is ridiculous. There's a new one like every other month, and it's like this group thing. And, and, and that won't happen in a place that it doesn't have that density. Um, one of the, the, it's like how do you solve problems are different depending on where you're at, what your perspectives are, uh, what experiences you've had. and and. The interesting thing is, I read an article a couple of weeks ago, it was Ev Williams. So Ev uh, had a great article in the New York Times saying the internet is broken. And I'm like, no, Ev, you broke it because you created <laughs> Blogger, you created Twitter, you created these platforms that actually encourage people to be, you know, rude to each other, to troll each other, to abuse each other. It, it's, it, you have to get out of that environment in order to not make that mistake three different times with Blogger, Twitter, and Medium. 
It's like you've made the mistake three times. You, you know, if you had brought somebody from Atlanta or brought somebody from Detroit and said, hey, I'm going to create this platform where people can talk to each other and say whatever they want, they'd be like, hey, hold on. No, no, we, we, know, we know what happens there. Go real bad. Stop. Um, so, so I think that you get a diverse perspective. And, and when you bring that to the table, uh, people solve problems differently. And they solve problems for wider groups. So you don't get this group think of, oh, I'm just going to solve the problem and you know, I'm just going to call it out because I'm a white male and I never get abused on the internet. And that's what happens. Mm -hmm. And so when you bring people from different perspectives and different you know, backgrounds and different geographies, they look at problems so differently. And so I've seen that in Detroit, I've seen that in Baltimore, uh, I, I see that here where the problems being solved and how they're being solved and who they're being solved by mm -hmm. uh, is, is, is significantly different. Yeah, and I would just add uh, two things. One is when you actually look at the data, I think first round capital did a really cool analysis of the first 10 years of all the companies that they um, provided seed funding for. And those outside the major hubs actually performed marginally mm -hmm. better over that 10 year period than those companies that were based in LA and New York. So I think it's almost, um, or San Francisco and New York, I think it's a kind of a testament to that there are kind of really great local resources um, and ecosystems that are building, that are supporting. The other thing I'll say is we see the same thing in our, the pipeline of women um, in our company, in, in Project Entrepreneur, in terms of the types of companies they're building. So they're very much solving problems mm -hmm. that are local and relevant. Mm -hmm. So we had a great woman who won last year who was based out in California, and one of the things that she saw was that there was so much waste that was food waste that was happening from what she kind of called ugly fruit. So it's fruit that never actually makes it yeah. into um, into like shopping stores because it has some type of you know ugly I don't know it's like an avocado with like a pimple or something. Um, so she actually goes and has created a whole business where she takes this uh, perfectly fine and perfectly healthy uh, food and uses it and sells it to different companies that can actually um, make it into packaged yeah. goods or whatever. Um, and there's a whole market for it. And she's building and growing the business and she's actually raised um, her Series A. So I think it's people are seeing real tangible challenges in their local markets and coming up with really innovative concepts to build. I know that company, it was, was it Full Harvest? Yeah. 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 I, I want to touch on something you said that I think I, I merits talking about, which is companies outside of Silicon Valley did better without all of the advantages. Mm -hmm. They did, even marginally better means they did a lot better because they yeah. don't have all the advantages. So they have to work harder and they, they it, it's like, that is, it's like how do you not see that and want to pour money, more money into that and pour more resources into that? I, I, that is what something that I think getting out of the bubble of Silicon Valley allows us to do. So do you think that there are advantages though for somebody who doesn't look like the kind of stereotypical, you know, hacker in a hoodie, starting a business in one of these other cities? Do you think are they at a greater advantage because there is more, it's more open or there's more diverse perspectives. Um, they're, they're not expected to only have graduated from a certain school or have a certain pedigree. Well, so similar in the same 10 year study that First Round Capital did, uh, those companies that had a female founder performed 63% better mm -hmm. uh, than their male counterparts. So I think um, when you think about kind of diversifying teams both in geography and in backgrounds, um, I think what the data is suggesting is that there is an advantage. It's not easy, mm -hmm. per se, by any means, but I think there is, we're at this kind of point where disruption and change coming from very different places and people, I think is almost, it's <clears throat> being embraced in a way that probably wasn't, you know, five years ago. Mm -hmm. I, I think in I think to answer to your question is it is it easier for diverse founders outside of Silicon Valley yeah. definitely uh, because we I, I don't fit the pattern even though I'm from Silicon Valley mm -hmm. I don't fit the pattern I've I've pitched in Sand Hill Road I've walked into companies as an engineering leader and 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 I get a much different reception and and I think going into communities where they're used to seeing people that look like me in positions of leadership, right, is, is a lot easier. And I think the same thing, you know, you don't come from a traditional background either. I mean, we are outsiders, even though we're doing the exact same thing. Yeah. And it is an advantage in, in smaller cities. It is, is, is an advantage in other cities uh, other than Silicon Valley. And in some cases, it's still a disadvantage. If you look at women, particularly African-American women, trying to raise money in Silicon Valley, 
I see them with the exact same ideals, better executed, and they can't get money on Sand Hill Road. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, it is, it is, it's appalling because they don't fit the pattern. They walk in and they see you know, an African-American woman or they see a, a, a Latina, and they, they make assumptions mm -hmm. based upon how they look and what their pattern matching you know, is, yeah. other than the actual merit of the person, the team they built, and the, the product that they're building. Did you want to add anything else? Yeah, I think um, especially in the smaller markets for people who are from cities, you know, 250,000 or less, um, understand you can control the culture. Uh, most of these cities don't have strong leadership uh, and their economies are uh, sometimes just they happen, right? Um, Silicon Valley didn't happen strategically, nor did New York. They just happened because in New York, Philly got tired of all the people coming in and pushed them up to New York. Um, so. You know, just understand you can set the culture. And we're very intentional in our meetings, articles we write in the newspapers, um, our meetings with city councils, mayors, and expressing the kind of people we want uh, involved and making sure it's inclusive holistically and celebrating, you know, uh, senior citizens who are doing startups. I mean, we have retired, I, I love this one guy, he's a retired senior citizen who is missing a limb and he's trying to um, distract phantom pain. And he's like body hacking and coming up with solutions. And like that's a great story to tell for people to understand. It's for everyone, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, so, but that brings me to sort of the next thing that I'd love to all of you to address. So it's great to sort of bring all of these resources in, but a lot of these cities are really hurting. There are a lot of workers that need to be retrained so mm -hmm. that they can take advantage of all this activity. What are you seeing? And can you talk, can you address? Um, can you let our audience understand how that's happening? How, are, how is retraining happening? Where is it coming from? Is it coming from the government? Is it private industry coming in and creating training programs? Are the startups doing it? How, how does it work? Yeah, from our side, it's both for sure. Um, we, I'm very proud to say we've seen the state governments and the local governments really step up uh, to once they see a trend in a, a vertical and some things are starting to happen, the parents obnoxiously start asking for programs, mm -hmm. and the kids do, and so then the, they've funded new robotics and CS programs and EE. Um, you know, and then the, the, the startup side, we've seen people start little boot camps and three-month training courses to meet their needs, uh, and industry is starting to ask for that as well when they need um, something. We just find a way to get it done if it's a maker space, work with the library, um, you know, workforce training centers. I think it's, it's all, but it really does come from the people. Yeah. The government will never solve your problems, period. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to agree with that. Uh, I, I see uh, a lot of the same thing. Uh, it's foundations, it's community organizers. Uh, there's, a, there's a great new uh, uh, boot camp in San Francisco called Tectonica. Uh, it was started by uh, the, the, the woman who organized the uh, I Look Like an Engineer event. Um, right. Michelle Glausner. It, it's an amazing, she just decided to put this together and she's taking people who are mid-career, people who are early in their careers and teaching them uh, full stack engineering. And, and, and I see that that's part of the retraining. So it's, it's the community doing it on its own. And mm -hmm. yeah, there's, there's work that the governments do do and, I, and, and cities and local governments do do and I, you, know, you take that help if you can get it. But I really do think it has to come from the community. Uh, there are organizations in St. Louis who are teaching people you know, a 12 week program on how to code. I mean, these are all community based organizations and I really do think that's where it begins. You know, it has to begin at the community level to bring the people in the community and give them the resources to, to learn and then, you know, work with the, the industry to make sure that there are opportunities available as well and make sure that, that the opportunities available don't uh, assume that the hacker that they're going to bring in, the program they're going to be in is going to be the person in a hoodie. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of organizations in St. Louis or in Kansas City, you know, are like, hey, we want programmers. And when you look at Wired, when you look at Fast Company, when you look at, at all the publications, a programmer looks like a white guy in a hood. And, and you, you have to do that education as well. It's like, we're gonna be bringing people who are going to be in their 30s and 40s and 50s. We're gonna bring in people who are going to look different, who are gonna come from different backgrounds. So, you know, don't try to pattern match. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why we wrote the book. Honestly, it was to kind of change that, that narrative mm -hmm. um, to kind of crush the stereotype of, you know, what it means to work tech, who works in tech. What, did you wanna add anything on that point with the, what your entrepreneurs are experiencing in terms of finding local talent? Yeah, you know, I was actually going to bring up something different that I thought was really cool actually here in Nashville, and I think it is kind of this idea of a public-private partnership. Um, you know, when I think about uh, this NEAT program that's being rolled out here that's focusing on employment for 
uh, people with autism and how the city has really mm. reached out and called on organizations like UBS, like HCA, to find opportunities that enable um, you know, people with autism to take their skill sets and their unique skill sets and put them to work in different capacities. Um, I just think it's people, these, this idea of giving people opportunities that align with kind of their core, both their, their values and their experience and, and skill sets, I think is really fascinating. So I just, um, it, that to me was a really innovative way, because when you look at unemployment, particularly amongst that population, it's huge. Yeah. And so I think that there are some real efforts um, that are taking place, and it's, you know, kind of across, across uh, both sectors. I, I love, you know, I, what I, a common theme here, I think, is this idea of it's happening at the grassroots level. It's happening mm -hmm. from the ground up. If we're going to address the issue of diversity in the innovation economy, it's not necessarily happening from the top down. And it's, I, I, for me personally, I think it's very heartening to hear about all of these different things happening in so many different parts of the country and, and in corners where, um, you know, where, where people have been hurting, where they've been suffering, yeah. where they, they have not had opportunities um, to work, where their industries have completely changed. And so to now have the opportunity to do something completely new and be part of something that is yeah. just beginning, I think is really exciting. We only have a few minutes left, so um, uh, I think I'm just gonna throw it to you guys. What is your advice? I know we have a lot of entrepreneurs here and investors. Um, what is your advice to them about looking for, in terms of entrepreneurs, looking for financial and human capital in their own backyards? Where should they start? And, uh, and if you want to address investors, um, are they missing out if they're not looking for deal flow in their own communities? Yeah, I think um, for investors, it really depends on the community, right? Uh, a lot of people can waste a lot of money really fast. And it happens in smaller markets where a doctor, lawyer, or like the town rich guy thinks he's a VC and fails miserably and then he's jaded. It's his fault. It's their fault, it's everyone's fault mm. in the town. Uh, and it doesn't mean it doesn't work, it just means that they don't have the right uh, network, uh, access to capital and strategy of how do you scale, uh, appropriately right size scale a company in a small city. Uh, I don't think you're going to create billion dollar startups in small towns typically. Uh, so I think the expectations need to be set. So it, to, to get there and where the opportunity is for a VC or in a, an investor in a small town, it really has to have a champion. It's either a community or a person or people who have the relationships in and out of the key markets. And um, you know it, th that helps. Um, for the startups where to look for that money, I would say uh, stop looking for the money uh, to start and actually start trying to find evangelists and champions. Mm. Ask for a lot of help. Um, build something and ask for help. Stop chasing dollars. You're, you're a fool if you're doing that because you won't find it find help and you'll find the college professor someone will want to you know, next thing you know someone's going to cut you a check and it might be small but it gets you by for the next little bit that's great advice wow uh, you, everything i was about to say uh, you <laughs> actually said that it's it, it's don't chase the money chase the relationship mm -hmm. uh the relationship may not write you a check today it may write you a check tomorrow or next week or next or they may introduce you to someone who can help and and find people who believe in you and believe in what it is you're doing um, and, and particularly people who believe in you, because you may come up with an idea that doesn't work, mm -hmm. but as we have seen, and you know this as well, and you know this, is that I will always go with the A team over with a B product as opposed to a A product and a B team, yeah. because the team is, is what gets you over the line. And if you put together a good team, you can fail and somebody will still come and fund you. Somebody will, you know, your, your relationships will help you out. Um, you know, and, and also, so, for you, those of you in smaller markets who are looking for programming talent, looking for engineering talent, you may have to change what your definition of an engineer is. It may be the person who's been sitting teaching themselves on their own. It may be somebody who you had never thought. Uh, and I've run into people here who's like, I couldn't find somebody, so I just grabbed this person and we made them into that person. You may have to invest in people yourself. And that's okay, uh, because you'll find that those are the people who will stick with you. That's a really good point. I know with the proliferation of, boot, of coding boot camps online, I mean, you know, I think there was a time when you had to have a degree in computer science or engineering to get some of these jobs, but now some of, you know, particularly if you're a startup, you need to be able to hire the best people and it doesn't necessarily mean they have to have graduated from Stanford. So, go ahead. Yeah, I would just add, I agree with, with all of that. I would add, um, and we see this base, you know, really on our client base, and I, I spend a lot of time um, with our clients, people give locally. Mm -hmm. They care about their local communities. 
more than anything. And I think they are looking for local entrepreneurs to be the springboard, to be the kind of lifeblood that helps their city, you know, revitalize, grow, succeed. And so there is a ton of focus on, on you and your fellow entrepreneurs to kind of pave the way in your, in your market. And so I would say this idea of not chasing the money, I agree because I think people do invest in people, but they also invest in, in their communities and their local markets. And so to the extent that you are building something uh, in your city, in your town, uh, there will be people that will support you. They'll provide resources, intellectual capital, capital, um, and, and we do a lot with, uh, with organizations like Launch, like the Entrepreneurial Center. Those are really great kind of places to network and to kind of see where there is talent locally that you can leverage. Um, so I, I actually think this is a great, a really exciting time to be an entrepreneur um, in some of these smaller markets. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Lori, Leslie, Nick. I salute all of the work that you're doing. It's really exciting and inspiring. Thank you so much thank for you. joining thank us. You. And thank, thank you. you.